engaging the public with archaeology threatened by climate change. I am at the University of St Andrews, but I also work with the Scape Trust, uh, along with Ellie and Tanya and Joe, who are over there, and I'm pleased to say that Katinka has joined us as well, who used to work with us. And if we've been um, tweeting madly, and we're also responsible for fly posting uh, half of uh, Glasgow, so hopefully <laughs> that's why you came here. Okay, so, first of all, is climate change a problem? Well, when you see photographs like this, and I am only going to be talking about coastal, we have been looking at uh, sites being affected by other things, but I'm talking about coastal stuff. When you look at photographs like that, you would say, certainly, yes. And we have organizations like the IPCC, which are forever bringing out publications which indicate that climate change is real. However, the problem is that although we know in relation to the coast that the sea levels are rising, it's predicting whether there are going to be more storms and more intense storms. That's where the, 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 the science is a little bit less sure. However, there are a number of organizations, uh, and we've heard of quite a few of these today, who are becoming more and more engaged with this idea about uh, cultural heritage and climate change. But we do need to be aware that we have had big storms and we have had changes of the coast for many, many years. And on my first slide, I showed you the Lewis Chessmen. They were found uh, sometime before 1831, possibly because they were eroding out. This site here, there's Gordon Child up at Skara Bray. That was uncovered in a storm in 1850. And we've got Yarlsoff, which is uh, uncovered in a storm in the late 19th century. However, that is not to say that we should try and disassociate ourselves with climate change. It's just that we can't categorically say that coastal change and climate change are one and the same thing. However, it does look as though things may get worse in the future. And what is the problem? Well, it, big storms, uh, coastal surges, and all the rest of it do things like they expose uh, human remains at the coast. Here we see a photograph of Jo. Uh, she has a midden above her head. And here you can just see a corbelled structure in the sand there. So, and here we have another Orcadian site. Uh, this is a both North and a later medieval site. Uh, here we're up in Shetland with a Pictish site. Uh, this is a Viking house up in Shetland. And here we see even on hard cliffs, we do have problems. And uh, we were with the uh, Royal Commission uh, looking at a community project there uh, just last week. And you can see this huge bite of land which has been taken out of the uh, 16th century fort at Eyemouth. Oh, and we also have uh, obvious things which are associated with the coast, like boats, uh, navigation beacons, and, of course, Second World War remains all around the coast, all falling to sea, into the sea. And how grave is this threat? Well, as an example, I'm going to use a Balasha over in North Uist. This photograph was taken in 1946, and the purple line shows where the coast was. And here, archaeologists were worried because there was a very large archaeological site. However, almost 50 years later, here is another photograph, and we can see that, in fact, there was very, very little change. Not much had happened at Balasha. And then in 2005, there was a storm, and in one single night, that entire archaeological site was washed away, and the distance from here to here is about 50, five zero meters, all lost in one storm. And this is one of the problems that we face, is that we can't actually predict where the problems are going to be. So, We've also uh, been hearing about uh, sea level rise, so up in Featherland, it's a fishing station up in Shetland. Uh, it once had two harbours, or two bays, both with uh, fishing boats within, within them. And here we see some of the fishing booths, very similar to what Lilia was showing us, but a little bit later, uh, to the Icelandic examples. And here is John Manili uh, doing uh, a piece of very dangerous laser scanning on the edge of a cliff. And from the laser scan that he produced, these gray rectangles, these are the fishing booths, this is the mean high water, but if we add just one meter to that, you can see the effect. If we add two meters, and if we add three meters, now a three meters tidal surge, combined with sea level rise, is not unbelievable. So, if we don't act, this is what's going to happen to our sites. This is over in North Uist, and here's Emily at the back, valiantly trying to record uh, one of the little pits on the beach before she drowns. <laughs> now, why are we working with the public? Because all of the work that we do at SCAPE is uh, public focused. Well, 50% of the work that we do is public focused. Why are we working with them? Well, one reason is because if we can get to people and talk to them when they're quite young, 
Maybe they're going to get an interest in archaeology, which they will uh, keep with them all their lives. And here we are over on Balasha, uh, on the beach there with the school. And here we're in the Weems Caves, again with the school uh, trip. And in this case, uh, these caves are threatened not only by uh, climate change and by landslides and coastal erosion, but we do have a problem with vandalism. So by bringing the schools in and teaching them about uh, the archaeological heritage, uh, they get to um, understand and care for the uh, material. And here we have a school, we can get the schools actively involved, so we can take them, we can have talks with them, we can take them around, get them to uh, find things on site. But here we've got a group down on Eyemouth, they're out actively uh, surveying, and as you can see, all the thumbs up from either side and one from the middle, which was quite cool. And here again, back at Eyemouth, we have members of the community helping us out with a, a geophysical survey. And we also work with people to actually do, und uh, to undertake full-scale excavations, and this is up at Brora in East Sutherland at some eroding salt pans. And this community involvement uh, means that the importance of the archaeological site and also the, the threats that we have from climate change cascade outwards beyond the communities themselves. So here we have two members of SWACS, the Save the Weems Ancient Cave Society, who have been talking to their local MSP, David Torrance, and David Torrance then brought the whole project, the whole uh, problem of erosion up with Fiona Hislop, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, and the Cabinet Secretary in Scotland then instigated a workforce, a task force, to go and look at the problem of climate change at the Weems Caves. And at Eyemouth, we had two members of the Friends of the Fort manage to uh, get uh, Paul Wheelhouse, who was, at the time was the Minister for uh, Climate Change and the Environment, and Paul very kindly put on an event in Parliament, and he also came along with the Royal Commission the other day. So, the community are able to approach the uh, politicians and the policy makers sometimes in ways that we can't actually do. So that's great. How are we working with the public? Right, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. We've seen a lot of this with the other talks, especially uh, with Citizen, what was going on with the Rapid Coastal Zone Assessment Surveys. In Scotland, we had our own Coastal Zone Assessment Surveys. Ours were based on the Welsh ones, so the Welsh ones came first. Uh, Historic Scotland has been sponsoring these. And archaeologists have been out recording the geology, geomorphology, and uh, noting down all the archaeological sites at the coast. And the areas in blue are the areas that we've surveyed to date. So it's just under 50% of the coast. But there has been an aim to try and look at the uh, more vulnerable areas, the areas which are more likely to erode. Uh, and in that uh, area, 12,500 sites have been recorded. And we work with the local authority archaeologists and with Historic Scotland and, and Commission and various other people to prioritise action at these sites. And we ended up, from the 12,500 sites that were recorded, we managed to come up with 322 top priority sites and another 618 high priority sites. So these sites are both valuable as archaeological sites. Uh, I would say some, many of these are of international value, but they all are also highly vulnerable to erosion. However, many of the, sur well, the surveys started in 1996, that's almost 20 years ago. Things change quickly at the coast. So we had a, a long list, it's great having a list and we know what's there, but if we don't actually go and A, check on whether things are still there, things might, be, might have disappeared. Uh, and secondly, if we don't actually start acting or working with these sites that are on the list, then uh, there's not really much point in having this in the first place. So we have started the Scotland's Coastal Heritage at Risk Project, or SHARP. This is just to confuse people because we're SCAPE, we have a project called SHARP. And we're also working with the Scottish Archaeological Research Framework, which is SCARF. <laughs> and we're trying to combine all these things into shape and shark. And we're able to do this because of funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund, amongst others. Uh, we also have uh, Historic Scotland and the Crown Estate and the University itself. But, but it is something within this country we have a, a tax on uh, gambling, uh, and that tax is used for our heritage, and that is a fantastic thing, and it's something that I would encourage all of you in all your other countries to go and do. Tax gambling. <laughs> and we have taken, these are the uh, Coastal Zone Assessment Surveys, that's the whole lot of them. We have taken all of those and then miniaturized them into a mobile phone. So we've digitized all of the records, and we've put them onto an app. And we've also put them onto a website, and this is very similar to the projects that you've been hearing about earlier today. We're then asking people to go out, use their mobile phone to go and take photographs of sites, use a very simple form to uh, send us some updated information. You can use your GPS, 
and just uh, send information in and let us know what exactly is happening, whether the sites are still there. And you can also use the app in order to uh, tell us about new discoveries. Uh, and so this is a site that we're going to be looking at a little bit later, but there is Ellie up at Chanowick. Uh, this uh, was, uh, you can just about see around here, there's some basket work. This was a uh, potentially Bronze Age basket that was uncovered on a beach uh, in North Uist. Uh, it was recorded with the app, and by the time AOC had come out, the, uh, an archaeological group came out to excavate uh, this uh, remains, the whole thing had been covered over with sand again. That was in just in a, a, la a matter of four or five days. But because the GPS had been used on the app, the, we were, or the local group were able to go and tell uh, the archaeologists where the site was. And this is over on Sandy. This was discovered uh, this winter. Uh, somebody saw the back of a, a child's skull, and again, um, a group came up and excavated that child, the child in the sand. And so, uh, very quickly, uh, after two and a half years, We've had 1,099 surveys submitted, over 2,000 photographs. There have been 350 volunteers involved in updating all of the records. I just showed a photograph of you, John. I missed it. <laughs> 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 um, we've had 906 volunteers involved in the project. Plus, there's been another 5,000 because we don't talk. We, we don't count all the people who come along to talks and things like that. So another 5,000 uh, additional face-to-face -face reach through uh, walks, talks, and other events. However, updating the information and uh, improving the record and making sure that everything is up to date is only the start. And we're also having 12 community-led projects around the coast. And these can be interpretation projects, surveys, excavations. But we are also trying to be creative and we're trying to be experimental. And I'm just going to like go back in time a little bit, talking about our creative arts projects. Here we are back on uh, Ballashire again, where we have two archaeologists, including Tanya, who are being depicted themselves by a group of artists who are on the top of the section there. Who, they, they are depicting archaeology in action. And we film absolutely everything. So the, the camera's always there, and you can see the camera's actually over here. And a lot of our footage was used, and one great film, not possibly the most snappiest of titles, Heritage at Risk, recording the history of Brora Scotland before it's washed away, However, it is a great film. I would definitely go and uh, recommend that. That was made by Reagan Allsop. Uh, she was an intern with the National Park Service, and she came over and filmed uh, some of our work in Scotland, and that was absolutely fantastic. And Katinka helped us to uh, organize a photographic competition. And here we have Joe Niven, aged eight, from the Isle of Unst, and here's his photograph of an accessorized boot. However, Apart from the creative arts projects, uh, we are very much more involved in doing recording projects as well. So one that we've been doing uh, with the local community and the Nautical Archaeology Society is at Newshot, very close to where we are at the moment, where there are a number of schooners uh, which got burnt uh, in 1914 and were dumped there, and also some mud punts. And this vessel, this vessel is actually the, um, what we think is the oldest surviving diving bell barge. So divers used to go down with their hard hats and used to go and dredge out the Clyde on that. And we have been working with local volunteers, and Courtney came along as well, uh, recording some of the mud punts uh, in various different ways. And we've also been, and we've seen this before as well, but like the, the uses of uh, hexacopters and pole technology, and well, pole technology, stick a camera on the end of a pole and stick up <laughs> pole technology uh, to go and take photographs from the air is fantastic and the high resolution, once you start uh, using uh, structure from motion or photogrammetry you can end up with very very high resolution images as you will see as I zoom in on that mud punt. So there it is, there's the mud punt and you can see the footsteps of the guy who took the photographs. Now zipping up to Shetland, we've been working with Archaeology Shetland up there and this is the site that I showed you earlier, this is Ellie again at Chanowick and here is the section and you can see it is a, a huge jumble of stones. But earlier, uh, well, last month, uh, working with Archaeology Sec Shetland, uh, Joe and Ellie got the whole section cleaned up, recorded, and here you can see what it is. You can see there is the outer wall of a brock here, and within that there is a, a wheelhouse that's been inserted, and you can also see just here that there is the brock well. 
So this site was an unknown brock. Nobody actually knew that this site was here until uh, very, very recently, and no one had interpreted it as a brock. But now that it's been cleaned up by the local volunteers, we now have ourselves a new brock, and there's Ellie looking wistfully at that hole in the ground, and that, well, hole in the section, I should say, and that hole in the section turned into that. And this is an Iron Age well. And to give you a sense of scale, there's Ellie down the well. We were up in Orkney as well. At the same time that uh, Joe and Ellie were at, uh, um, at Chanawick, I was at Muir on the island of Sandy. And this is a project that we're doing with the Sandy Archaeology Group. And it was an excavation of a burnt mound. Uh, it wasn't that burnt mound. Burnt mounds are usually nothing more than piles of burnt stones and things that normal people would not necessarily want to go and excavate. However, some of the uh, examples you get in the north, up in Shetland and in Orkney, have things like this inside them. And this site was uncovered in a storm, and it was rapidly excavated uh, after the storm. And you can see that there was a stone trough and a lot of upstanding stonework. And the stone trough is where the burnt stones were rolled into to heat up the water. Uh, and there was also a small cistern here with an overflow coming out of it. And so because the site had been rapidly excavated and published, the local group decided that they wanted to take the surviving stonework, which was just left on the beach, and they wanted to move it to their heritage center, where they could use it for interpretive purposes. We thought that would be quite an easy project to do. We'd done something very similar about, uh, to that, and I'll show you that in a minute. And so here we are with members of the Sandy Archaeology Group, moving stones off the beach. And here's their trusty hexacopter, and also uh, kite photography, and here is the site after we've taken all the stones off. So you can see this is where the cistern was, there's the overflow, here's the stone tank, a passageway, and some rooms to the side. <coughs> we then lifted all the stones up and transported them across the island, and we built this. And so if you go to Sandy now, you will see this. And in fact, uh, the cistern and the hearth cell at that stage, they, they were uh, using new stone, but everything else that you see there is original Bronze Age stonework. However, when we started dismantling the site, we realized it was slightly more complicated than we had at first thought, so we went back again. So although the site had been completely uncovered, uh, when we came back uh, this year, all that we could see was the very top of one, one of the stones. Everything else was covered up. The, the sea had come up, covered the entire beach again. So we started doing the stone removal again. And this was the, uh, what we thought was the system to start with. Uh, these stones, when we left them last year, were completely horizontal but the power of the sea has knocked them, as you can see, at 90 degrees. And we also had to combat, and we've seen this with Steve's talk, uh, combat the weather this year, which has been fairly appalling. But here are people working on the site, pumping out the well, <coughs> I should say as well. And what we were able to discover is one, uh, because we didn't, although we had made the reconstruction with a hearth cell, we didn't actually know for sure where the hearth cell was, but we suspected it was going to be in there. And you can see, indeed, there is our hearth cell. So that is where they heated up the stones before rolling them into the tank. And it had a beautifully uh, beautifully paved floor with lots of um, uh, burnt uh, or uh, scorched uh, clay around it. But more importantly, we also found this thing. This is another well. So this is a Bronze Age well this time. Very, very deep one. And at the bottom of that was a lot of fantastic organic material, which is at the moment in Orkney College with Scott and Julie and just waiting to be uh, looked at. And just to show you that it is a real well, it still functions perfectly, and that water apparently is drinkable, and it's going to be turned into Sandy Shandy, I believe, very soon. <laughs> but we did have one third surprise as well, because when we took the tank away, uh, the very base of the tank, we found a structure underneath, uh, and this is Kath Parker, who's doing a fantastic job at cleaning out this structure. And there is that structure. This was covered by the Bronze Age uh, Burnt Mound, this is predating the Burnt Mound. This could be Bronze Age, or it could be Neolithic. Now, if it was Neolithic, that would be fantastic, because we would then have the well Patrick, because this is yet another well. That means we've got an Iron Age well, a Bronze Age well, and potentially a Neolithic well. So that's not bad going. Chris Burnt Mound, I'm just very quickly going to zip through this one just to show you. This is a, a site that we did in Shetland. This is what inspired our work up in uh, Orkney. This was uh, the site during the reconstruction. So we've taken, we've taken all the stones away from their original site. We then had to build this enormous hole in order to put the stones back in again. This is when I thought I was going mad, but uh, two weeks later it looked like this.
this. But the point, the reason I'm showing you this is because the community of Incrusta have um, interpreted the site. They have interpretation boards down, and this is what we're going to be doing at Sandy. But we also were able to build a replica burnt mound, which we've been using for experimental archaeology. Uh, we've been employing uh, hippies and various other people coming down, <laughs> setting up the stones, which we roll into the water. And there I am, uh, checking to see how hot that is. Uh, and we've also, the, the local group up on uh, Shetland have been using the site for uh, in uh, low open days, uh, learning about pottery techniques. They've got a, 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 a dig for other people. And we were working with Archaeology Scotland on that particular site. So this is a, a very good learning resource. And I'm going to now finish, right now, by talking about the Weems Caves, which we've been doing with the York Archaeological Trust and with SWAX, the Save the Weems Ancient Cave Society. Uh, and this is a very exciting project. Here is one of the Weems Caves on a nice sunny day, and this is what happens when it rains a lot. You get landslides. So these sites are being threatened by both coastal erosion and landslips, but the caves are home to a wealth of Pictish carvings, uh, there are hundreds, and this is a, a royal commission uh, post up, uh, paste up. But we also have Christian sites, and we have uh, 19th century graffiti, and this one here is potentially uh, the earliest carving of a boat in the United Kingdom, possibly a Viking ship on the walls. So we've been working with York uh, to record the caves in a number of ways. There's the trusty hexacopter uh, with uh, Macduff's Castle, which is also a scheduled monument in the area below it. Uh, and there is uh, one of our laser scanners that work. This is one of the York Archaeology Trust laser scanners. I'll show your laser scanner up in Fairland, John. And uh, here is one of the models that's been made from this. So this is the entire coast edge uh, with a color added to it. There's the mesh model. And here is one of the laser scans. And you can see just up here, that is Thor with his hammer. So the laser, we have very high resolution uh, scans of all the caves. And these scans are helping us to understand the caves in completely new ways. We can see where, exactly where the passages are going. But more importantly, uh, Macduff's castle uh, was always thought to be in danger of collapsing because it was thought to be right on top of the well cave. But through the laser scanning, we can now see quite clearly that it's not directly on top of it, and also that there is a huge amount of rock uh, in between the two. So that is helping us with our... Um, with, uh, this is helping Historic Scotland and various other people to come up with ways of managing uh, this particular site. But the community involvement has been great at Weems, and we've been using RTI, or Reflectance Transformation Imaging, which I'll show you a little bit of in a minute. But here is the local group doing some RTI in one of the caves. And again, uh, here are the kids running around. They have little sheets, and they have to go around and find all their carvings. Um, and we put all of that information onto this website. So, I'm not going to go through the whole website, but there it is. It's called 4dweemscaves.org. Um, that's quite a difficult one to remember, but uh, it's definitely worth looking at. At the moment, we only have the Jonathan's Cave stuff up, but over the next couple of months, we're going to be putting up all of the cave stuff. And when you go in there, you can walk around, you can look at the uh, visualizations, uh, you can look at the high-resolution scans. And this is RTI. RTI is basically, you use your mouse, you move your mouse over the screen, and as you do, it's as if you're shining a virtual torch, and it brings out the carving in completely new ways. You can download all of the RTI data, and we're going to make uh, other data available for download as well. But the project was also great for involving the community. Uh, we were able to film people, get them to talk about their memories. Uh, some people were telling us poems, some people were uh, singing songs. Uh, and also, we had a big oral history project in as well. So we were asking people to come in, show us their photographs, uh, tell us about the past. We were recording what they were saying. And again, we've added all of this to the website. So I will finish off by showing a couple more of the photographs of what East Weems used to be like uh, when the sea came in. So that was a very, very quick run through of some of the projects that we've been up to uh, in this year. Uh, Involving the public, I think, is absolutely essential because if people understand the value of archaeology, they're more likely to want to help us to preserve it. And so we have to work with everyone. Thank you very much.